Theodore Roosevelt was now President of the United States, the youngest person to assume the presidency at the age of 42. Roosevelt was very interested in foreign issues and one of the first projects that he tackled was the construction of a canal in Central America that would allow U.S. ships on the West Coast to get to the East Coast quicker than having to go all the way around the tip of South America. Support for that idea had been growing since the Maine exploded uh, in February of 1898, right before the Spanish-American War started. The USS Oregon, a battleship in San Francisco, was dispatched to take the Maine's place, but the voyage around Cape Horn took 67 days. Although she was in time to join the Battle of Santiago Bay, the voyage would have taken just three weeks had a canal been constructed. Now, there had been an effort by a French canal company to start to construct a canal in Nicaragua, but that company had gone bankrupt and so the canal had never been completed. And there were those who favored the idea of starting that back up again. A volcano eruption in Nicaragua will make that not be such a great idea anymore and so then people will begin in Washington will begin to look towards the region of Panama which was at that time a part of the country of Colombia it was a very poor section of Colombia well Roosevelt opened negotiations with Colombia in early 1903 the Hay-Haran Treaty was signed by both nations but the Colombian Senate failed to ratify the treaty because they wanted more money from the United States. That infuriated Roosevelt. He felt like they were, it was highway robbery what they were wanting. And so when he was approached by rebels from Panama who, was in, who were interested in trying to launch a revolution and get their independence from Colombia, he, in a controversial move, implied to them that if they revolted, the U.S. Navy would assist their cause for independence. Now, Colombia, the easiest way for Colombian soldiers to get to Panama if a revolt broke out was to go by water. Otherwise, they would have to cut their way through jungle, the, the roads were pretty non-existent, and it just wouldn't work. And so, by insinuating that there would be at least a ship from the United States in the area that could prevent them from coming, that would be a big boost for the Panamanians, and that's exactly what happened. Panama proceeded to proclaim its independence on November 3, 1903, and the USS Nashville in local waters impeded any interference from Colombia. The Panamanians returned the favor to Roosevelt by allowing the United States control of the Panama Canal Zone on February 23, 1904 for 10 million dollars as provided by the original Hay-Haran Treaty signed on November 18, 1903. The canal would be completed by the outbreak of World War I in 1914. It took a long time to build the Panama Canal because of the rampant spread of tropical diseases among the workers. Over 200 workers died of yellow fever and malaria spread by mosquitoes and Roosevelt initiated work on clearing swamps and other areas in which the insects bred. Now the United States would remain in control of this uh, canal until the presidency of Jimmy Carter when Jimmy Carter will return control of the Panama Canal Zone back to the country of Panama. Roosevelt saw it as the duty of more developed nations to help uh, countries that he considered to be underdeveloped move forward. In the Philippines, he used the army to build railroads, telegraph and telephone lines, and upgrade the roads and port facilities. He also brought in American teachers. He dramatically increased the size of the Navy, forming the Great White Fleet, which toured the world in 1907. Now, he'd been interested in the Navy since his days as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and so when he became President, he was very interested in expanding the size of the Navy. There was also a thought that if they sent it on this world fleet, this world trip, it would go into the vicinity of Japan, it would actually go to Japan, and it might intimidate Japanese leaders there. Japan was kind of on the rise at this time period. It had won uh, the Russo-Japanese War. Japan had actually come out victorious, and that had really shocked uh, most of the world. 
And so Japan was kind of flexing its muscles at this time. And Roosevelt was thinking, you know, we really need to kind of give them a show of strength. Let them be intimidated by the U.S. Navy and they will kind of back off. Because they were wanting to expand out in the Pacific. Well, of course, the United States was wanting control of certain areas in the Pacific themselves. So he sends this fleet off on this world tour. It could have been a publicity disaster uh, because there weren't really enough fueling stations. There were a couple of times when it looked like uh, a couple of ships were going to break down, but they managed to get all the way around the world and come back to the United States. However, the visit of the Great White Fleet to Tokyo uh, also encouraged supporters of the Japanese military who wanted the Japanese military and Navy to expand. They had always argued for an even more aggressive Japanese shipbuilding and naval expansion program, and the show of force by the U.S. convinced enough of their countrymen that they were right. In a real sense, this set in motion the chain of events leading to the U.S. and Japan confronting each other 30 years later during World War II. Roosevelt also added the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, which stated that the United States could intervene in Latin American affairs when corruption of governments made it necessary. Basically what that said was that if a country in South or Central America was having difficulty paying, making debts, or uh, paying debts that they owed to European countries, rather than risk the chance of one of those countries coming back over and trying to reassert control, Roosevelt said that the United States would go into those countries and would help them organize, help them get their finances in shape so they can make those payments. Now it's one thing if you're asked to come into a country to do that, it's a completely different situation if you just swoop in and say we need to do this and so it's going to cause some real problems between the United States and South and, and Central America. It was like Big Brother kind of hovering over them and so it's not going to be an easy relationship with Roosevelt as president. Roosevelt gains international praise for helping negotiate the end of the Russo-Japanese War, for which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Domestically, a, a national emergency was avoided in 1902 when Roosevelt found a compromise to the coal strike by the United Mine Workers of America that threatened the heating supplies of most urban homes. Roosevelt called the mine owners and the labor leaders to the White House and negotiated a compromise. Miners were on strike for 163 days before it ended. They were granted a 10% pay increase and a 9-hour working day from the previous 10 hours. But the union was not officially recognized and the price of coal went up to justify that. That's what the mine owners did. Roosevelt promised to continue McKinley's programs and at first he worked closely with McKinley's men. He asked Congress to curb the power of trust and they did not act, uh, but Roosevelt did, issuing 44 lawsuits against major corporations. He was called the Trust Buster. Mark Hanna was the rival power in the Republican Party. If you remember, he had been William McKinley's best friend and the man that had really orchestrated and uh, funded McKinley's uh, elections and the fact that he won both uh, terms as president. But Hannah dies, and with that, Roosevelt had an easy renomination and re-election in 1904. He became the first president who came into office due to the death of his predecessor to be elected in his own right. Building on McKinley's effective use of the press, Roosevelt made the White House the center of news every day, providing interviews and photo opportunities. And the next uh, video lecture will actually talk about him coming to uh, into power with the rise of the progressive movement and the muckrakers. And so you'll hear all about that in the next uh, lecture.